So here we have it. It's another episode of Words with Friends, the episode where I get to be able to introduce you to one of my good friends and for us to chat about a single word. Today I have my good friend Mark Bowden. I'll tell you a touch more about Mark in a second, but Mark, welcome. Good to be here. Thanks for having me, Phil. Thanks for having me in your home office right know, now. Right? And welcome to my home office. I think it looks beautiful. I love the reflection in the background. Sorry. I love the fact that I get to see your neighbors. I love the fact that there is <laughs> yeah. just so much going on. It's like a crazy, crazy time, right? Yeah, yeah. I can, I can hear your, your little birds in the background. My, my dad uh, is a keen ornithologist. So, so I used to go around with him uh, looking at birds and hearing their calls. So I may, I may be able to tell. Yeah, see if birds. you can know. And your word is not going to be ornithology today. That is not where we're going to go. <laughs> we're going to go somewhere else. And for those of you who don't know Mark, Mark is the world's leading body language expert. He's written a boatload of books about it. One of the books that he hasn't written is the other Mark Bowden that wrote a different <laughs> book that's done way better than any of your books. But still, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come to that at another point in time. But just to give you some understanding of the kind of people that Mark helps, is Mark helps people like some of the biggest brands in the world to understand more about body languages, work with some of the, uh, the well, global leaders, work with Real Madrid Football Club, and also work with people like me. So the question I want to kick you off before I give you with a word is, um, who's your favorite client? Oh, wow. Uh, I, you know, I love the ones that are just ridiculous that you're in the room with them. It just, you just, as you walk in, before you walk in, you go, what have I done? What have I done now? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say who those people are, okay. but there are some people who you just can't believe you're about to be in the room with them. And then you meet them and it's like, ah, oh, it's just a human being. It's two arms, two legs and a head, roughly in the same place as mine. They're, they're trying to deal with gravity just like I am. And so, and so the work that we do on, on nonverbal non, uh, non uh, influence and persuasion, body language, um, you know, just pans out the same. They've all got the same problems as everybody there else. There you go. Yeah. Well, I always find it nervous every time I communicate with you because I just uh, decided ahead of time that you're judging every micro movement, facial expression, any kind of little tick or clue that is happening right now. You're writing a book about every one of those behaviors. And then I learned to be like, all right, he probably is doing that, but whatever. Yeah. Well, you know, look, not really. I mean, at the moment, I'm trying to get eye contact with you and your audience through the lens uh, up here, which means I, you're in my peripheral vision right now. And, and even if I did want to kind of study you, that takes my conscious mind and I'm trying to have a conversation with you at the same time. You know, really to read people's body language, it's a little more, um, I mean, look, we're doing it all the time unconsciously. Okay. It's just as an expert in this, you don't want to be doing it unconsciously, you want to be doing it consciously. And by doing it consciously, it takes up a lot of neural load, which means you can't do a lot of other stuff and come across as social as you might in other situations. So we'll tend to read people's body language under the conditions of um, interrogation or interview. Yep. And, and so that's not that social. Like I'm, you know, I'm gonna keep you in a room for a long time. Yep. <laughs> You'll want to go, we'll, well say let me, no. Let me introduce you to the world we're gonna talk about today. And yeah. knowing the body of work that you have, knowing one of the books that you have produced that I've particularly enjoyed reading is your book, Truth and Lies. Yeah. It's quite often that what is talked about in your work is the truth side of things. What I'd like to lean into is this whole area of lying and why yeah. that is perhaps such an important thing for us to be able to talk about right now, because people are looking to be able to judge the communications they're having from a variety of different areas, whether it's coming from their boss, whether it's coming from their customers, whether it's coming from their political leader, wherever it's might coming from is that we are concerned is, are we having the truth told to us? Is this person lying to us? So to kick off on this is, Mark, is, is I've heard so many of these little like nuanced sayings that if somebody touches their nose before they say something, it means they're categorically lying. Or if they look up and to the left, it means one thing and down to the right, it means another. Is there any truth in any of this stuff? No, all nonsense. <laughs> I mean, you know, part, part, look, there is no, there is no um, Pinocchio's nose. Uh, Pinocchio's nose is literally a fairy tale. And that's why we love it so. It's such a great idea, isn't sure. it? I mean, imagine a world in which you could tell somebody else was being deceitful with you because their nose would literally grow, you know, six inches in front of you. Wouldn't life be easier? 
Yeah, but a hell of a lot easier. If that were the case, well, that's why it's a fairy tale, because life isn't easy. The world is full of, of deceit for very important reasons. Look, lying is one of our most important social skills, as is telling the truth. The key is, is knowing when to do one and when to do the other in order to be socially adept. The socially adept can lie and tell the truth. And the socially adept are also able to accept a lie and accept the truth and know when it's good to do one or the other. So there is no um, one indicator, okay. deceit or lying. You can look for clusters, but they're not often what you what the internet has told you to look out for. Um, it's, it's quite a difficult job and that's why you have experts do it because, because you alone will have some biases around how you look out for liars. Okay. And if the, if the lie, if knowing if it's a lie or the truth would be valuable for you, you should be doing it, you should be looking for deceit in a professional way. Right. If it's, not, if it's not valuable for you, then just use your instinct, which has got about okay. a 50-50 chance. Okay. So is it okay to lie sometimes? So that's really interesting. So um, St. Augustine wrote two, two treaties on, on lying. Uh, and uh, he came up with a whole kind of hierarchy of what, what was uh, less okay and a little more okay. He actually said, look, no lying is good. Uh, same as in Buddhism, they, they say that no lying is good because essentially, uh, spiritually, you should be searching for the truth. I, I'm not, in, in, I mean, that's a whole other discussion as to what is <laughs> right. the truth. So let's not even go there. But, but St. Augustine said, look, the worst lies are ones that are told in a religious context. Like if I take a, a, a religious book and I tell you something is in it that isn't in it, that for him was like, that is super bad. Like you must never do that. And then the lies that there were about, uh, I think uh, seven or 11 different types of lies that he talked about. And, and the, the one that was kind of best okay is a lie that you tell in order to stop yourself being, having any bodily harm, put it, okay. get you out of trouble, get okay. you out of physical trouble. But even he said, look, that, that's not like, that's still a sin that you lied in order to save, save yourself getting injured. That's yep. still a sin. Um, I don't agree with that. I, as I said before, lying is one of our most important social skills. Imagine a world where you're not able to lie. And there are people out there who are not able to lie. And they need a lot of care around them because they will get badly hurt. They will get ousted from society and therefore they will uh, they, they won't get food and water and, uh, you, and all the can care. Can you give me an example have. of what you mean here? Because I think I know what you're saying, but but just give me an yeah, example. Yeah, so there, of... is, there are some there are some people on a certain uh, neural spectrum who have very a uh, great difficulty um, augmenting their description of the world that they see around them, and so they will be honest with you. Yeah, so they might come up to you. Uh, <laughs> Not you particularly, Phil, but let's just imagine. <laughs> they come up to somebody and they go, they go, I think you're ugly. I think you don't look good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, and this could get socially awkward pretty quick, right? Yeah, really awkward, re really quick. Yeah, yeah. So imagine a world whereby, you know, you have a, you have a partner and, you, and, you're, and the idea is you live together because you, you know, it's more interesting as two and, and, and safer to, 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 you know, for many reasons. And you're not able to lie. You tell the truth and your partner says, hey, how do I look in this? And you say, Psh, not good, not good. Not because of the jacket, um, because of you. Like most things don't look good on you because you're just not a good coat hanger for clothes. Um, you know, that's just the way I see it. Yeah, that conversation doesn't go very well from there, I'm guessing. Well, I, you know, try it. Try, try being I don't think I would try honest. that. Uh, so you've if learned. I'm being honest, I do not think I will tell my dearest other half that she does not look good in what she's wearing. Right, but then... But I might tell her lying? that I think it would look better if she did blank, blank, and blank, or that I prefer the other one. 
Mm. So, so for me, you're augmenting, you're augmenting the actual thought that goes on in your head initially of that doesn't look good. Okay. So what we're doing is we're saying on you, like it looks, it looks good on other people. I've seen it in the magazines (laughs) and it looked really good on that model, but then you've got more weight on you than that model. And, and so the, so is that a lie though? If you approach this conversation in the way that you say, well, I'm not going to tell the brutal truth, but what I'm going to do is give a filtered version of the truth with a bias towards a, you know, a more polished outcome. Is that still a lie? Yeah. St. Augustine says it is. Okay. (laughs) I mean, he wrote two books on it. So I don't mean, you know, should we argue? Well, probably we should for a start, you know, always argue with somebody who's written a book on anything. Yeah, you that's might have a that's the general status quo, right? Right, right. <laughs> is that if you say something is one thing, expect somebody to say something different. Right. So, so look, I, I, I think it is. I think any augmentation of an idea that comes up into your head and at the time feels like truth and fact, yeah, your truth, if you don't blurt it out straight away, you are suppressing the truth i would suggest but i would suggest that's a good thing okay are you seeing any examples right now of of people making public statements where yeah cool your general feeling is they are saying one thing but you do not believe them sure so at the moment in the current crisis that we have right now we've got a health crisis on at the moment in the current crisis we are being trickled information at a certain rate right now to augment our behaviors. Uh, If we got all the information that everybody has about this all at once, it would overwhelm us. And the fear is is that there would be civil unrest. And so, or or a state of, of, of panic beyond what you've already seen. Yeah, so I would suggest, and, and I think history plays this out as we, as we go further down, uh, even the history of this crisis that we're in, we'll notice a week later we get some information that you go, yeah, they knew that a week ago, but they held that back. And, and this, is not, this, the this is not a conspiracy other... theory, this yeah, is just spin... the reality of, of working with the general public. Spin this the other way, right, for a second. It, mm-hmm. and, and let's look at this on a, on a smaller level say you're a leader in a company and that you are looking to be able to actually be in that role of sharing information with your workers, with your workforce about what they need to navigate in the coming weeks and months, et cetera, with a huge amount of uncertainty about it. What happens if you find yourself needing to deliver a message that you don't necessarily a hundred percent believe in, but your job requires you to be able to believe in it? Well, that's being a leader leader is full of compromise that's why most people don't do it they can't handle it they can't handle the compromise number one they can't handle the bigger view for a leader that's really leading a a big organization in some tricky situations and having to take in many many bigger world views yeah there's a a a level of of data which if they handed that down to many people it may not even be heard for a start because I'm trying to deal with being at home with the kids. I can't deal with the, the economic ramifications in five years time. So, so great. You handle the five year plan. Please don't give me any information about that because I'm just trying to deal with making soup right now. And the fact that there's no yeast in, the, you know, there's been a panic buying on yeast. So I can't even make do the fundamental thing of making my own bread. Okay. Yeah. Do, do I really need to know about, uh, you know, what we think is going to happen with overnight lending rates and what, what like, do we, cause you could, you know, your leader could give you that. Yeah. So they let me tell you everything. Mark, you're so, on yeah, camera they, right now. Mm-hmm. You're a leadership expert. You're a presentation skills expert. You are wearing your jacket and pocket square that I know that you would always wear. Your glasses yeah. are looking on point. Your hair is divine by the way. Thank you. My friend. Um, and I don't know how you're getting your roots to look so good with the compromises that need to be made. I was lucky. I got it. I got them, got them done a week before the whole thing kicked off. 
But there seems to be a lot of honesty in the way that you're set up there right now is that what you could do in this given moment is I'm guessing you could make your environment look a lot more studio like if you wanted it to, you could adjust lighting to appear more professional, etc. Is there conscious choices in the reason that you're showing up this way around at this very moment? Absolute conscious choices. So I so let's talk about what you first pointed out, which is I've got the jacket and the pocket square and the shirt that you have seen me in whenever you have worked with me or met me in a professional capacity yep. anywhere else. I can make this choice. This is a choice that I can make today, or I could choose to be wearing nothing or in, <laughs> right. in my, you know, camouflage jacket or, or yeah, whatever. You could be in a hoodie with a baseball cap could on. Be in a hoodie and I have, and I have all that stuff. The room that we're in right now, that's less of a choice for me simply because, the, you know, I've got my son upstairs doing his lessons, uh, Tracy downstairs, uh, daughter in the basement doing her lessons. There's only so, this is the room that's most available right, right. now. But I can, so, so I got to make choices and I choose to show up with you today in the same uniform as I would have if I were doing a keynote with you and your audience. Okay. okay? So, and that's my and, and that may may not be the choice that other people would make, but it's my choice because I can make it. The choice of the room is a little less my choice. Like the kitchen would look fantastic right. at the moment. Like it would look stunning. It would look the light would be amazing there right now. But people are going to want to have lunch, so right. So, so you've got to room. work around yeah. that with some with okay. some truth, right? In again, of, of saying okay, this is this the is right not, environment. This is not the full truth. So, for example, you know, you can probably see back back there. There seems to be a picture uh, back yep. back there, and it's strategically placed back there because often in a in a meeting that I have with people, I will go and get this picture and show them this picture up okay. up front. Yeah. And the reason I show them that is that it's very clear then that like some of them, I have kids. Yeah. And that causes an affinity okay. and that is a, a manipulation. All that you're seeing around here is a, is a manipulation. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's some choices that I've made. I'm not choosing to show you that area. Am I? <laughs> yeah. That's a little, is, do you expect that? No, I did not. Okay. No, so that's this mayhem over there. Mayhem <laughs> in that part over there. Okay. Now that I did just choose to show you that, which I will often do on interviews like this. You went, wow, I got to see something. No, I do that with everybody. But you didn't. You didn't. You right. didn't realize that at the time. That was a great moment for you to go. Wow, I just saw something that nobody else has seen. No, I lied to you just then. But that's the magic. You must never let fact get in the way of a great story and a great entertainment. Okay. By entertainment, I mean from the medieval Latin, entretenir, which means to hold together. When we entertain, we hold together with an idea. And that moment when I show you, look at yeah. my mess, you laugh because you release some tension that you've had around the mess that you're in as well, because you have that mess too. Of course. Everybody yeah. has some mess, right? Whether you right. see it or don't see it, we all have some mess that is, is there in the world. You just made me think of something, Mark, which is mm. when somebody gets caught out in a lie, yeah. a typical response sometimes is, well, I, I was joking. Like mm. the response comes back, well, I was only joking. It wasn't like, it wasn't serious, therefore it's not serious. Right. What's your take on that? Well, did we laugh? Like jokes need to produce laughter. Okay, that's, okay. that's the purpose of a joke. It, it releases the tension that we have um, built up around something that we're anxious around. It releases it in, in the movement of the lungs that produces a laugh, okay? Um, not tears. That, that, would be, that would be, you know, crying would be, would be different. That would be a, a moment of tragedy that would produce the tears. So, so I say to people, okay, you were joking. What's their laughter? My guess is, is when they say, I was joking, it's another lie. Okay, they're just lying again. Okay. okay. And then some of what I would say is jokes it... are supposed to be funny, right? <laughs> right, right. And if, if, um, if, uh, you know, I would say, um, if they've lied and they weren't prepared for the moment of being found out, they're lazy. So lying, so, so lazy liars don't prepare for the inevitable outcome of being found out. 
Ah. What you need to do is when you lie, is to go, okay, uh, I'm lying because I need this upside. For every upside, there is a downside. Yeah, because things balance it's out. It's all for a every balance prize, and, a, and a managing a risk, I guess, really, is what you're suggesting. Manage the risk. You've got to manage the risk. So look, I work with people and we will often talk about, okay, we're going to have to lie here. We call it what it is, which is we're going to lie. We're going to lie in such a way that it's a good lie and that people believe us. Now, we're trying to do it for good reasons because we're kind of trying to do it for the helpful thing. Often the helpful thing of people won't get hurt if we tell them this. Yeah, but they won't listen to the truth, but they will listen to a lie that will stop them getting hurt. Then we also go, when are we going to get found out? And what is the cost going to be? And can we save the resource? Are we ready with the resource we need in order to pay the price? Because the price is coming, maybe not tomorrow or the day after, but in five years time, 10 years time, 15 years time, people will go, hang on, you lied about that. And some will go, yeah, thanks very much, actually, because that was really helpful. <laughs> and some will go, that, I don't like that. I, didn't right. like, I don't like getting lied to. I'm coming to get you. And at that okay. point, you go, okay, there you go. There's the money. There's the resource. Stop. Can Calm you give down. me an example of this that you'd either recognize and most other people would recognize through history or and um, an example that could hypothetically be showing up in a, in a business landscape right now? So try and, try and give me both of those so we can see. Yeah, that yeah, absolutely. So um, in Winston Churchill's wartime speeches, he would often say, talk about how the British people were going to win. He did say, look, I can promise you blood, sweat, you know, toil, yeah. tears. Yeah, so that, there's truth. Here's what I can promise you. And at the end of it, we will prevail. He didn't believe that at all. Right. <laughs> Absolutely didn't believe that at all. He knew in his heart the British people were, go were sunk. Yeah, they were, they were, they were going to okay. get that the war machine of Germany was going to absolutely annihilate them. Okay. And, and you, you just made me think of a scenario. My, my dad and, and letting people kind of get behind the curtain a little, we used to, used to run a lot of kids' football teams. In particular, he'd yeah. run my older brother's football team. And I remember once a, a, a kind of team talk in the halftime of extra time of a, a, of a kind of cup semifinal or, you know, with the under 11s or whatever it was at the time. And I was nine years old and I still remember this lie and I remember the power of the lie was what was happening is he told his group of players that he overheard them being called as a group of so-and-so rejects. Right. To light a fire up underneath them to say, we'll go show you that we're not that thing. Right. Um, and the result was it created some grit amongst them as a group of players and they went out and went on to be able to win the cup, right? And so it came out uh, maybe like just three, four years ago with some of the group being together, having a few beers where they still believed the story was the story to which my dad revealed the truth. And there was a little bit of uproar and a little bit of laughter and a little bit of like, thanks for that. Like it helped us find a new level of performance. So I can see how that could, could play out there and actually be beneficial. Interesting. And maybe he gives them the truth at an age where they, where he now feels they can handle yeah, the truth. they couldn't handle it at 11, but at 40 years of age, they could now figure it out. <laughs> yeah, so you know, who can handle the truth at 11? Look, you know, there's a, there's a, a big crisis going on with, uh, with health at the moment. And, and, and we're discovering, you know, as days go on, uh, the reality of that. Now, should I sit my 11-year-old and my 14-year-old down and, and, and say, look, here's, here's the reality, look. You know, if dad gets this, and there's a good chance just because of my demographic that I would get this, um, the one thing we've got to avoid is me going into hospital. The moment I go into hospital, I'm about a 50-50 chance. Okay, kid? What is that? That's the truth. Is that, so should I tell him the truth? Or should I say, don't worry, it's going to be okay. It's right. going to be all right. right. Which is better? One is a lie and one is the truth. Our most important social skills, or one of our most important, is being able to lie. Now, I know they're hearing all kinds of stuff as well. And one of their most important and optimistic uh, social skills is to be able to accept the lie that I tell them because, because it's more optimistic. And optimism will help. Yeah? Yeah, I, I, I see that. 
Oh, I see that a lot. And, and now let's just move that to, you know, we talk about kids. I think it can become a lot easier to understand those principles when we're thinking about the leadership we mm -hmm. provide within our family unit. But let's see how that shows up that you're, you're in middle management of a larger organization and, and what you need to do is to give the everything's okay speech when in the back of your head, you might be thinking, well, a third of you are going to go missing next Friday. Like, like how do you navigate that? Yeah, it's really tricky. And, and maybe you can't. So maybe it's not a job for you. Being a leader is maybe not a job for you because you're not able to compromise. Yeah, you're not able to see the complexity of life and make a compromise and make a choice of doing something that is not good over here to get a payback of something that is good over here. Maybe you're not able to make those compromise choices. Really good leaders are. They're able to say, I'm going to do something bad over here because it gets a good result over here. And there is a conflict between the, between the two. So how do you navigate that? Well, I don't, I don't know unless we have a look at the, the exact situation, but I, but I know the navigation of that is complex and not easy and not everybody's cut out for it. And often the conversation that I have with my clients around that is not a conversation about here's the words you're going to right. use. It's about here's how you're going to manage yourself, your idea of who you are in, in this crisis situation, because you are going to say things that you know are not entirely accurate because you want to help people more. And is this like acting? Is this that you have a duty to play the role and the responsibility that is attached to that role? just like Robert De Niro has to show up in, you know, in a movie and, and, and quite often be the bad guy and do bad things to people. But I, I believe him in the movie, but I also believe that perhaps if I was to bump into that guy in the street, he might not have those same character traits. Like, yeah. um, is that what some leaders have to do here is that they have to understand they have a duty to the role and therefore they have to show up and be honest to the role and not necessarily honest to their own principles. Is, yeah, is no, that the well, game? Yeah, well, it's, it's, more, it's, it, it's more tricky than that I, um, because it, it is nothing like acting. I think acting is a great metaphor that we use all the time okay. because we think we understand it to go, it's a bit like acting. Uh, acting isn't like this. In acting, the audience, the public know you are an actor. Right. No, it's like you're in the program in the theatre or they, they already know this is Robert De Niro pretending to be somebody else. And there is a safety with that. The moment De Niro shows up okay, as the villain, we go, OK, good, I can handle this. OK, I once did a film years back, back in the days of, um, of making uh, Brit flicks, gangster Brit flicks. And the thing was at the time is the cool thing at the time was you'd always want to get a real villain. In your film yeah this film that i did we got some real villains in our in our film some proper yardies and they brought along proper guns <laughs> like proper loaded stuff and they shot it off and and it was uh it was proper scary right <laughs> and you went you just went that was a stupid idea the real thing is not the truth is not good the truth is not good. So no, being a leader is not like being an actor because, because you are the real thing talking to the real thing, right. not a pretend safe version. Robert yeah. De Niro's villain is safe and that's why we'll watch it. Because it feels like a con otherwise, right? If somebody's being an actor in the real world and then that gets found out, you've been conned. Look, the, the, well, then once, once you get into the metaphor of the actor and real people, we're into the idea of, of the metaphors of putting on masks, which was a okay. metaphor that came around in about the 1960s, an idea of we all wear masks. It's a metaphor. We don't. We don't. It's a, it's a simple way of looking at the complexity of human persona, which is it's a collection of facets of faces. It's a collection of things that we show different people and we can move and glide from one to the other. Sometimes it gets a little bit mixed up and we show the, the, the face, the, yeah. the facet, the persona that we normally have with our family, 
you know, professionally or, or start performing the persona that we've used professionally with our family and people go, what are you, what are you doing? This is weird. Like, what, who, who's this that's, that's shown up? And sometimes there's a, there's a part of our persona which, is, which has been suppressed and pushed down and under stress or the right trigger, up it comes okay. and suddenly it shows. And, and your whole friends and family or work go, who the hell's that? Okay. It's you, it's you. That's right. who it is. Showing up as the, the real you, right? Yeah, and acting is different because acting is a safe psychosis. There's a lot being said right now, particularly in this time of crisis or significant change or, or, or certainly uncomfortable, uncertain times. I've mm -hmm. heard it being said in the last week, maybe a dozen or more times, is the truth sets you free. And it's being thrown around as a set of words that is something like it, you know, ta-da, the truth sets you free. As like that in itself is enough to be able to then spawn out whatever needs to happen next. So in Mark Bowden's point of view, is it true that the truth sets you free? Well, it's a lovely um, truism. <laughs> you know, something that, so a truism, you know, is something that sounds so right that you just go, yes, the, of course, the truth will set you free. Yeah, I think that's the Bible quote. And the truth will set you free. Uh, it sounds so possible, it's beautifully hopeful. Is it accurate? No, it's not accurate at all. The truth, the truth may well set you free, it may well, um, it may well put somebody else in a prison. Yeah, it could so, paralyze, it could, in, yeah. <laughs> could paralyze, it could, I don't know what it's going to do. Yeah. So, yeah. no. It could create chaos. A, it could create chaos. So that's a, that's a truism, and I love truisms as much as the next person. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a truism that is meant, it does what it's meant to do, which is causes hope in some. Okay. And they go, great, yeah, good, good. We've got something to hold on to. The truth, the idea of the truth. Well, then you've got to investigate the truth. It's like, oh, oh, well, you know, have you got, how long this you got? This is exhausting just thinking about it. <laughs> oh, and once you get into that, it's why lies are just, it's more interesting and fun because it's kind of a little bit easier to get your head around. Yeah. The truth is now, and now you've opened a can of worms. So is there anything you can give somebody that if they're needing to be able to actually tell a lie right now that they believe is for the greater good, and that that is their, their overall belief system. Is there anything that you can help them navigate, anything that would be valuable to them that could give them perhaps either a little more competence or confidence in, in approaching this circumstance and, and achieving at least the outcome that was hoped for? Yeah, so, so, so look very clearly into what effect you believe you're gonna get by giving the information, the idea, the story that you're wanting to give. Be really clear about that. Think, okay, if I say X, my belief is, is that I will get outcome Y, yeah? And that that is, there is a benefit to that. And think about who does this benefit? So you've really got that sorted out in your head. Yeah, so, so you're honest with yourself. If you go, this just benefits me and I want the benefit. Like, okay, here's why I'm lying. Because it benefits me and I want the benefit or be honest with actually it does benefit them out there as well and i want it for them i mean just be really clear about what it is you're doing what effect it's going to have and who do you think that that benefits so think about that first of all then on the other side okay when they find out and they will find out eventually because the facts will come out eventually that's the nature of the world yeah maybe not even to them but their friends or family, or in history, somewhere, some yeah. point, somewhere, it's coming, okay? What will be the cost, okay? And are you prepared? So here's the outcome, here's the benefit, here's the cost, yeah? Do you still want to do it? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? And if you come up, yes, go for it. All right. I like that. That feels like a fairly decent place to stop talking about lying. <laughs> Mark, I hope you found it useful today chatting with me about a word that you know more about than most people on the planet. One of the things that I like to do in conclusion of a show is just to ask a real simple question, which is what is your favorite word and why? Oh, gosh. 
Fait. Very apt. Fait. It's a beautiful word, a much maligned word. Um, because again, it, 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 when you think about the idea of fake, it really opens up the possibilities of what you can create and how what you can create can be as good as the thing you're trying to copy, the thing you're trying to emulate. And that you cannot emulate anything that you did not have a seed of in the first place. That's just not the way the brain works. The brain doesn't do new stuff. It takes stuff it already has and starts to grow it and adapt it and look at the opposites of it. But it always takes something it already knows and then starts to develop on that. So fake is, is, is a much maligned and misunderstood okay. concept by the majority of people, I would say. I'm going to ask a couple of bonus questions because you've just yeah, made me think of something and something that, yeah. I, um, that I wanted to ask of you anyway. We, we both have a, a fairly mutual love for variations of modern art. Mm. And, and I wanted to ask you about, in particular, um, Mr. Brainwash. Yeah. And his <laughs> body of work, which to me is all fake, and oh. I love it because just, of that. Oh, so it's so, you know, the first time I saw Brainwash, like it hit me, it hit me in my stomach. And I was like, and I'm on a, I'm on a, a whole um, uh, a forum with a whole bunch of other graffiti artists and collectors yep. as well, you know. The, the artists tend to be the collectors as, as well, yeah. And and we see this stuff, and I I'm instantly like, and I go, this is horrible, this is awful, but I must have it. I love it, but it's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. It's like it's so it's so clearly derivative and awful. Like my God, this, he's done Chaplin. He's got Chaplin. It's like ah, oh, it's Athena bad but I need it, I want, and I can't bring my, like, am I gonna pay for, like, am I really gonna, and like, everybody was saying, like, are we really gonna buy this? Are we gonna buy it? And then we're like, people coming in, yeah, I've done it, I bought, I bought one, I bought one, I can't believe it, I bought one. It's such a, it's a car crash, it's a, you cannot look away. You cannot look, right. you cannot look away. It's, it's what we call allotropic, you know? Yeah. It's like, you, you love it and you hate it at the same time. And then there's the whole thing of, is it Banksy? Right. And, uh, I don't, and, you know, and I just don't. The story, the I'm, conflict. I'm close-ish. I'm close-ish, but I'm not so close that I, that I know for sure. <laughs> and maybe the truth will set you free. Maybe. <laughs> no, no. The, the story, this, like being able to do this with you. Yeah. Tackling, tackling the uncomfortableness of, of Mr. Brainwash is more interesting than being able to go... Oh no, it is Tari, that's who it is. Or, or going, go, yeah, it is Banksy. Or it is, you know, Banksy's factory making, making them. Like that, that is just like, okay, dealt with that, on to the next one. Right. Like, you know, I could sit down for hours with you. The conflict and, and, on this, and, this requires and, and, and deal plenty with of the urban conflict and, yeah. <laughs> of the, of the and why, lion. And why do I love that thing that looks like a, like a fifth grader's school project oh, man it's all it's awful and brilliant at the and ho it's horribly brilliant i mean it's it's and i, I can't even believe i'm say, saying the word brilliant with it but it is it is it's like ah oh, ah oh, it's a like a it's like an awful thing <laughs> I, can't, I don't know what, i mean how do you, look i'm rabbiting on about how do you how do you feel about it like what I, you, i'm very much the same and i i remember <laughs> seeing it gurgling up and i then remember <laughs> watching the documentary of yeah. exit through a gift shop yeah um i spent a chapter of my life living in notting hill around yeah, some of sure. the um some of the areas where banksy's original work would throw up and yeah. and was very fascinated about this whole street art scene and then see mr brainwash's stuff and think that that is terrible and then go through the same set of emotions of like i think i really like it um and i think <laughs> i'm going to buy one is like I'm right there right ah. now, and and I think it's ridiculous. And what I even find even more fascinating is the number of people that are now doing iterations of Mr. Brainwash's work, yeah, at a slightly reduced price in the same way. And I'm like, do I want the fake of the fake of the fake mm. of the fake, 
Like, right. how far do we go with this? Right. Oh, all the way, if you can. In my, <laughs> in my way, if you could, in like, if you got the, if you got the where, you know, if you have the readies, if you could afford to, <laughs> just get it go all the way. <laughs> because what a great story! What a great story to be able to go. Look, there's a bank suit. There's a brainwash. There's an iteration. There's somebody, you know, yeah. we've got, we got a guy, an, an artist in Quebec. Yeah, and, and there's my four-year-old daughter. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Who's done a Mickey Mouse as well. And, yeah. and, and she yeah. said you could follow your dreams. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah Amazing. Wow. Well, I'm pleased that we got that little tangent. I feel like that went somewhere, <laughs> somewhere even building on what we were talking about. I got one more question. Yeah, and it's just yeah. something I'm ludicrously interested in. What is a word that you've been using a lot recently that you didn't even realize was in your vocabulary that you're now getting sick of yourself using? Or just interested in the fact that you're using it more often than ever? <laughs> I mean, things like, well, I don't, though I do a lot of crisis communication, we don't say the word crisis a lot because, because, because we, when you, when you're doing crisis communication, it tends to be a few people in a room, you know, you're working yep. out how to, how this the, these few are going to communicate out but i'm doing way more to a general public now yeah. around how they're going to deal with this crisis and communicate as as managers and leaders to their people from their home office and so i'm saying to more people more of the time health crisis and it's like i didn't expect i'd be standing in front of people going okay health crisis um <laughs> and I'm using that awful word, uh, trying to avoid it, but new normal as yeah. well. That's a horrible it's phrase. It's like a gross phrase, which is a total, total lie. I mean, a total fabrication. Yeah. has the word normal in it. The, the one I keep tripping over that I keep saying all the time that I, that I hate is unprecedented is, you know, I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and then you find yourself, I've used that word an unprecedented number of times and you think you're an idiot. <laughs> That's what I think I am. I'm an idiot. But what else, you know, we're all, look, we're all, we're all managing and learning. You bet. We go along and, 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 and trying to get a decent vocabulary. And the truth that I think that exists right now is none of us know what we're doing and we're all doing a version of our best in whatever that Absolutely. may be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, I think the best, the best is, is we can look back on, on this and go, you know what? I did my best. I, you know, I put or I in, just did, I did something. I did, I did. I did, I did I just something. had a go. I did, you know, I had a go, I had a go at it. Yeah. And, and I love what I see. Yeah, and for any shots. of you that are needing to be able to understand how to deliver presentations virtually, you're finding yourself on Zoom, you're needing to be in video conferencing with your customer base, video conferencing with your team members that you're needing to be able to influence and persuade using this medium. Mark did a video that um, certainly helped me a great deal. I'd encourage you to go check it out. Um, because it's, it is real. It doesn't feel like a lie. It shows you how you can make this stuff work. It doesn't say that you need to go spend hundreds of pounds on tech. There's no affiliate links through to other things. I think my biggest takeaway was it, and I just took it one better, is Mark moves his laptop up onto a plastic recycling box in the middle of the video. I got myself a fancy nine pound tripod, is what I went for, fancy <laughs> nine, nine pound, pound, tri nine pound were, tripod on a webcam. You were robbed, mate. You were robbed. I, I know, I know, but we don't like my, my recycling bin is is a wheelie bin. If I pulled that into my uh, into my room, I'd be in a different different shape. Yeah. Mark Bowden, thank you for joining us, and um, tell people where they can find out more about you. Where there's the best place for them to find that video I talked about, and anything else they need to know about you right now. Yeah, simple. Just go to truthplane.com. T r u t h p l a n e. Truthplane.com. You'll find me there. You'll find links to everything. You'll find videos. Go there. Fill your boots. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you, my friend. I look forward to enjoying a glass of something fancy with you in person sometime soon and seeing that Absolutely. devilishly brilliant hair moving in the real wind and that kind of stuff. <laughs> Good Thank you, Mark. Good see you soon. Great to see you. Bye now.